on the tradition to green aviation. Today, airports in such big cities as New York, Paris, Moscow are located almost in the cities or near the cities. With the growth of cities and the increase in the number of air transportation, the problem of reducing harmful emission into the atmosphere, reducing noise and vibration is becoming more and more urgent. Next slide. On the figure one shows the primary emission from the commercial aircraft. Carbon dioxide emission from the aircraft are a direct result of fuel hydrocarbons burning. Given the strong growth trends in air transportation, the aviation sector will be increasingly become an important source of greenhouse gases and the impact on local air quality and global climate change is expected to increase in the future. According to estimators, greenhouse gas emission increased by 1.4% annually and CO2 by 1.8%. As one can see from the figure two, the aviation sector consumes approximately 30% of the total fossil fuel used in the transportation, which correspondingly to roughly between two and three percent of the total fossil fuels used worldwide. In addition to the terminal effect on the climate, traditional aviation has a strong effect on the quality of the ambient air, which is fraught with various lung diseases among the population of the planet. The main air propellant from aircraft flights is nitrogen oxide. The next slide, please. To solve the problem of emissions, the principles of the green aviation have been development which are based on the optimization of the flight schedules, change of the design of aircraft, they use the lightweight composite materials, change of the principles of the operation and design of the engine and the fuel used. We can differ now traditional aircraft as Sukhoi Superjet 100, for example, and all electric perspective aircraft as an experimental lightweight one and Sika 200 as prototype for the future power electrical aircraft we aim in the future. Yet. We can note the particulars of the both of them at this moment. Among the peculiarities of airplanes with turbojet engines, one can note first long driving pledge, short time for repair Nashing the fuel tanks, uneconomical fuel consumption, greenhouse gas emission into the atmosphere, and high nose level. The main difference of the electrical aircraft from the traditional one is an electrical motor, which receives energy from the electrical sources like batteries or fuel cells. The main advantage of such aircraft is an absence of the emission and possibility to recharge batteries during the flight. But today, there are only low power all electrical aircraft because of high cost of the battery. It shows service life, long change time, and leads to show driving range. The next. Thank you. There is a way to solve some ecological problem in the near future by the using of hybrid power propulsion system in the aircraft. It will allow to make the during range longer and to reduce essentially the emission from the fuel burning and noise from the aircraft. It can be made if the aircraft uses the electrical power from electrical sources during the takeoff and landing. And the rest energy in the cruise mode from the turbojet engines. The sample of power distribution on the boat with the hybrid power propulsion system in shows on the figure six. AC generator provides most of the power required by the load. Supercapacity supply, short-term peak power to the load transients. Fuel cell as secondary power sources supply power on the load. Battery supply or sink expects power in the system. Batteries also store regenerative Power. Like technology was realized, realized in the project by Airbus, Rolls Royce, and Siemens. 
in the figure seven hybrid two megawatts power plant of the flying laboratory ifan is presented it is worth to note that the dc bus voltage is three kilowatts it kilowatts excuse me it allows to reduce the weight of wires on the boat and increase the power to the weight ratio the next slide but the first flight on the hybrid airplane was not today it was on the 5th of april of, april of 1988 in the soviet union in 1988 tupolev 155 flying laboratory made its first flight the power plant of which run of the cryogenic fuel liquid hydrogen experimental flights of the Tupolev 155 provided invaluable experience for the further improvement of aviation cryogenic fuel system. The next stage of the Tupolev 155 project was the conversion to the more convenient fuel, liquid natural gas. There were three engines on the boat Tupolev 155, two turbofan engines, and one engine powered by hydrogen. A full tank with shielded thermal insulation contains 17.5 cubic meter of liquid liquefied gas together with full supply system and pressure maintenance system was located in the rear fuselage in the compartment constantly charged with air or nitrogen due to the structural difference of placement in the wind. The tank pipelines and units of the fuel complex had screen vacuum insulation provides the specified flow inflow. The next slide. Power DC DC and AC DC converters as an essential part of the power propulsion system for perspective electrical and hybrid aircraft. The voltage converters are necessary for correct transmission and distribution of the energy on board, as in an electrical as in hybrid aircraft. The power converters should respond to the following demands. First, high power density, high power to weight ratio, stable operation in event in the paper, reliability, slide eight to reach this purpose, promising trends in the development of the voltage converters for the power of hybrid aircraft to be fixed. Use of high power silicon carbide transistor to increase the efficiency of converters, using unpacked semiconductor devices, transistor crystals on the board, using a multi-phase switch management system, application of high-speed microcontrollers and digital signals processors. Increasing the voltage and DC bus to kilowatt. Implementation of micro channel and cryogenic cooling system. Following this way, it is possible to construct the converters with a high power to weight ratio of the device, stands of kilowatts per kilo, high efficiency of energy conversion, more than 99%, and with a long flight range. The next slide. Many companies deal with the development of the power converters for aircraft. Some of them on this picture are Cinemics from Fraungofer. The slide shows the photos of such converters for batteries charging on the boat. The next slide, please. In our institute, the Institute for Electrophysics and Electric Power, Russian Academy of Science, as a part of the work with the Central Institute of Aviation Motors, there was also created a range of powerful DC-DC converters for battery charging on board. Among them, I can note our converter, a multi-phase voltage converter. Its power is 10 kilowatts and input DC voltage from 100 to 300 volts. The output DC voltage is 150 volts. It has current regulation. Its maximum output current is about 70 ampere. We managed to develop a compact device 
with small dimensions and power weight ratio about three kilowatts per kilo. The next slide. Our last development is present on the, this slide. This is 20 kilowatts DC DC converter for battery charging on both. It's peculiarly in its high DC voltage. This device can operate in the range of the input voltages now from 800 to 1300 volts. Its output voltage and current are regulated. It has a digital control and fiber optics remote control. This device has better parameters in comparison with previous one. Its power to weight ratio is almost 10. It's three times better than first example. And we hope to these parameters will be in future even better. The next slide, please. The duration of institute work with in the field of the green aviation trend is called gas electrodynamic flow control system for aircraft. It's new modern part of uh, physics, uh, which is called plasma aerodynamic. Today, we use plasma technologies for to achieve control of aerodynamic flows is considered to be one of the most promising areas in aviation science and technology now. These technologies include atmospheric technology based on the interaction of discharged plasma ions with the air, which results in the formation of the electrodynamic flow. Plasma actuators which are used to effectively impact the boundary layer of aerodynamic surface, serves as device for the electrodynamic flow formation. Gas discharge is created about the surface of the dielectric plate in the jet formed by seeing about 10 microns on external and insulated electrodes located on the opposite side of this plate, to which a height alternative voltage is applied. The next slide, please. The use of plasma actuators of certain geometry and certain pulse power allows to increase the lift control and instability preceding laminar turbulent transition to the boundary layer or create, create volumetric flows with a high gas flow. For several years, our institute, in cooperation with the Central Aerodynamic Institute, have worked at the problem of a dynamic flow control system for aircraft. The work is carried out in two directions. First, plasma actuators and power. Second, the power voltage generation of special pulse shape for their supply. For this time, we have developed a lot of plasma actuators construction with different geometry and different substrate. Our institute creates a range of powerful pulse generation of different shape, amplitude, pulse duration, and frequency. One of them is shows of the figure 17. This is one kilowatt generation, is switch kilowatt pulses with regulated frequency and pulse amplitude due to constructed research on could be created the system. The generation unidirectional body force over length aerodynamic surface. Second, reduce the cross flow in swept wind boundary layer. Attenuate as of stationary and stable vortices. Delay the laminar to turbulence transition. So I can conclude that our institute adds to the principles of the green aviation and is working in this direction. Over the past few years, we have developed a number of powerful switching voltage converters as a part of powerful plants for electrical and hybrid aircraft, in particular for charging batteries aboard in aeroplane. Thanks to use of modern solid state electronic components and ergonomic design, we have managed to achieve a power to weight ratio from units to 10 kilowatts per kilo. Now it's it's very close to record numbers. In the fields of low temperature plasma physics, our institute is working as a gas electrodynamic flow control system for aircraft 
which is one of the pre pre primary importance for the increase in aerodynamic and energy efficiency, thus solving the environmental problem of reducing emission of carbon and nitrogen oxide and significant fuel economy. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Mr. Academician, Professor Vladislav Komish. For, thank you for your interesting presentation needed currently for the transition to green aviation. Our presentation uh, uh, is about the uh, possibility of special mapping on national inventories, uh, which was made in the Republic of Moldova uh, last year. Um, this inventory uh, was developed by Institute of Chemistry uh, in, uh, within the project uh, in this field, uh, which was supported by national, uh, United National Environmental Program. And uh, this report is placed on the uh, website, the respective website. Uh, the aim of this work uh, was the improvement of air quality inventory in our country and the uh, preparation uh, of action uh, which reduce air pollution of uh, short-lived climate pollutants. Uh, this work was made in the cooperation with Institute of Ecology and Geography and Institute of Power Engineering uh, and the coordination of Ministry uh, of Environmental, but in that time was Ministry of Agriculture, Regional Development and Environmental. Uh, uh, the respective uh, short-lived uh, climate pollutants as black carbon, methane, tropospheric ozone, and hydrofluorocarbons uh, are most important uh, after the carbon dioxide, uh, which are responsible for the 45 um, of uh, current global warming, which is a source from internet. Uh, black carbon, it is a principal source is uh, incomplete combustion, combustion of for fossil fuel and biofuels and different and other different uh, materials. Uh, methane emitted by human activity uh, uh, as a leaking from natural gas systems and uh, livestock production as well as natural sources as wetlands and others. Uh, hydrofluorocarbon also uh, are made, made greenhouse gases uh, and uh, tropospheric ozone uh, is uh, uh, major air pollutants and green gas which is formed in the interaction with uh, uh, different uh, um, uh, pollutants from uh, uh, industry, transport, energetic, and other sources. Uh, uh, the mapping of these uh, pollutants uh, uh, is a key element for the modeling of oil uh, pollutants in the region. Uh, of course, this inventory uh, is used as a base for the elaboration of this uh, mapping. And the first step uh, uh, is a uh, elaboration of uh, uh, partial emission in uh, according to the EMAP guides and uh, for the possibility to make uh, the visualization of the principal uh, air pollutants. Uh, the regular reporting of this uh, Inventory is not uh, made in our country, but uh, uh, should to be made in the near future, uh, according uh, after the improvement of this procedure in our country. Uh, the reporting of uh, gridded emissions, uh, 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 this reporting is based on the gridded emissions with the resolution 01 grade longitude latitude. Uh, also, it is a requirement of uh, uh, EMF, um, of uh, Euro uh, European Environmental Agency. Uh, th there is a special uh, document for the, as a guidance for this uh, uh, in, uh, mapping. Uh, 
first step is the preparation of initial data from uh, nomenclature of reporting, which was submitted in uh, your website. Uh, and uh, 25 air pollutants uh, uh, can be mapped after the preparation of the data from this uh, uh, report. Uh, the respective pollutants are presented on the slide. Uh, after the preparing uh, initial data, uh, the data will be placed on the special data, uh, and which can be downloaded from the respective internet resources uh, according to the guide, guidelines. Um, uh, in this inventory, it can be used the uh, most used uh, coordinate systems. Uh, because the uh, table of uh, nomenclature reporting uh, included uh, additional uh, columns with coordinates. Uh, these coordinates also uh, were obtained from the GIS processing of initial data and the creation of uh, proxy files after the uh, data relocation. Uh, Mm -hmm. Well, I use uh, several open sources for raster cheese data, uh, which is uh, can be used in this uh, uh, mapping and uh, as a reference uh, information for the future analysis of different uh, emission uh, different emissions. Uh, and also, and vector data can be used in this work. The respective uh, vector chip data uh, are available in the internet. Um, that is an example of the utilization of vector data for Moldova from uh, one side. Uh, can be downloaded the vector data as points, lines, polygons uh, in different formats. Uh, the, respective shapes, uh, which can be processed in different uh, GIS uh, software. Uh, for example, from Moldova, we use roads, uh, files, land use, and other information. Um, uh, it is an example of uh, uh, gridded uh, nomenclature form for reporting. Uh, you can see on, we can see only the two columns uh, as uh, longitude latitude uh, is additional uh, columns to the uh, uh, answer data which was produced yearly. Uh, after the uh, downloaded on of grid uh, grid for Moldova. Uh, we can uh, uh, report it, uh, all pollutants according to these grid files. Uh, the uh, QGIS software, as usual, can be used in this work because this software is free for the utilization and uh, can be used for the initial work in this activity. It, it can be used by our uh, administrative units and other institutions which are responsible for this reporting. It is an example for the demonstration of map from uh, OpenStreetMap uh, internal sources. Um, it is a demonstration of grading for our country, uh, which uh, was, was downloaded from the respective sites. And uh, we can use this software for the visualization of this grid and uh, creation of proxy files. Uh, I, I demonstrate only examples because uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, pollutants uh, and uh, I demonstrate only the uh, base for the data processing. Uh, it is an example of the processing of roads network in our country. Uh, this shape also can be used free from internet. 
and we can calculate uh, the density of roads for every grid. Uh, and uh, after the gridding of our pollutants and uh, uh, creation of proxy files, we can combine the density of roads with different uh, uh, pollutants by different categor category of inventory as transport, energetic, and other categories. Uh, it is a demonstration of we uh, obtained the point uh, information after the proxy file creation for every grid is the information for every pollutants uh, from <coughs> nomenclature for reporting. Uh, this, this procedure is uh, very clean and easy for the understanding of for the processing. <coughs> Uh, after the uh, obtaining of proxy files, we can make a uh, visualization of different pollutants. It is examples of uh, azote uh, compounds uh, emission from transport. Uh, we can see the hot points of these uh, pollutants and the intensity uh, because uh, it is a uh, uh, it, it was processed. Uh, as uh, for the special uh, fixing of the emission in our area. Uh, it is an example from non metamolecular volatile compounds, also from the transport. Uh, we calculate the density of roads, uh, density of uh, transport uh, emissions. Uh, it was a uh, work uh, principal in the creation of proxy files for the modeling and the report uh, further uh, calculation. Also can be used uh, from internet data for the, the density of uh, population, for example. Uh, it is also important for the calculation from energetic sector and transport because the population is an indicator of the energetic consumption and transport intensity, for example. Uh, the several uh, example of using uh, other software in this calculation, for example, MapInfo software. Uh, MapInfo is more professional as QGIS and uh, can be used by professionals in the modeling, interpretation, and movement of these uh, higher uh, pollutants in the surrounding territory and other impact to the climate. Uh, change and the higher quality uh, in the region. Uh, after this work, we can conclude this, uh, our inventory, uh, which is, uh, uh, can be proce processed uh, after, by the greeting, uh, according to EMF grid uh, requirement, uh, which uh, cover all major pollutants from the inventory report. Uh, QG software uh, demonstrates uh, as a good solution for the analyzing and mapping of the uh, climate pollutants uh, for the interpretation of uh, any uh, environmental information and uh, implementation in the, for the decision making and uh, make uh, this work can be made by uh, not professionals as students, uh, aspirants uh, and uh, administrative representative from uh, respective agencies. Uh, this uh, application allows to create informative and visual resources with the results of uh, uh, our research in this uh, uh, field uh, and uh, using GIS, GIS programs. Uh, the results uh, showed the hotspots of principal emission, uh, which can be used for the decision making in this area. Uh, the, this methodology will be used for emission inventory and reporting of Republic of Moldova in the near future. Uh, we have experience and uh, can produce this work, but uh, it depends on the decision of our uh, respective authorities. Uh, it is our uh, report, informative report for this uh, inventory. 
and thank you for the attention. Uh, I would like to mention at the beginning what I represent three institutions, actually. It is Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, Institute of Chemistry in Kishinev, and Hori Holubey National Institute for Research in, uh, uh, in Physics and Nuclear Engineering in uh, Romania. Today, I would like to present the data which we obtained for Republic of Moldova on uh, air quality studies. Uh, air pollution is a problem which every country faces. It um, happens because there are no borders for the pollutants. And we have as a final result, the global air pollution. Uh, even we can say what we have some uh, regional pollution sources, but at the same time, we also know what many pollutants are transferred on very long distances, contributing to the pollution of the countries where maybe some um, even some industrial enterprises are not operated. Uh, speaking about the assessment of air quality, uh, of course, we can use traditional techniques like, for example, filters, but um, not always it possible because of the high price of these techniques and the limited area where they can be placed. In this case, um, the best solution for this uh, is application of biological indicators because biological indicators we can find on the large territories. Um, they are growing, they are very abundant, and they have a high capacity to accumulate heavy metals, organic pollutants from the atmosphere. Speaking about air pollution, uh, there are two main indicators which are widely used by scientific uh, society. The first ones are lichens. Uh, which are usually growing on the tree, they're also growing on the soil. And the second, and maybe the more popular, is, uh, is use of mosses for uh, assessment of the air quality. And the application of mosses for the assessment of air quality is, is already a long story uh, because it is an initiative which was established at the beginning of 90s by three European countries. It was Sweden, Denmark and Norway, which proposed to use moss like biomonitors on the large scale to monitor the state of the environment, firstly in these three countries. Uh, after that, the program enlarged and more countries joined this program. And we can say today we have already around 25, 29 countries participating in the program. If firstly it was established like the European initiative and just countries from the Europe participated in the program, in the last year, since uh, the part of the program related to heavy metals was transferred to joint Institute of Nuclear Research, countries which are member states of the Institute, like for example, Vietnam, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, even there are no European countries, they also joined this program and they started to report the data. So how the program work? is very simple. Every five years, it is announced the MOSS survey. So uh, we have now running the MOSS survey 2020 to 2022, when countries start to collect MOSS samples on their territories. It is supposed like every five years, MOSS should be collected on the same sampling sites. After sample collection, the data are reported to ICP vegetation program and they are edited such type of atlases, which includes the information about elements. Uh, at the moment, there are reported 11 elements to this program. There are presented the data on these elements for every five years. What is um, from the last survey, which was uh, performed in 2015-16, uh, in total, more than 5,000 samples, uh, most samples were collected in uh, countries. Here there are represented just the countries which participate in this program. And sometimes the question arises, what more, why MOS is used like biomonitor for air quality? The, uh, the answer is very simple. Mosses don't have very well developed root system. And it is supposed that they accumulate these elements mainly from the atmosphere. The main, let's say, um, advantage of this atlas is what we can trace how the situation in the countries which participate in this program change during this period when they participate. So you can see what, for example, the concentration of lead 
was significantly reduced from 90s to 2015, almost by 80%. It explained by the fact that many countries, they adopted two rules which restrict the use of leaded gasoline. That's why just one, uh, let's say, order, which was uh, established by many countries, uh, resulted in a significant reduction of the load of lead on the environment in many European countries. The same is the situation with cadmium in vanadium. In the case of these elements is also observed a significant reduction. It can be explained in several ways. One, in some European countries, uh, this ecological rules, let's say, they are very strict. Uh, they um, more, moderate the enterprises, uh, including some filters which just capture these emissions. In other countries, like for example, in Romania, Bulgaria, some of these uh, enterprises, they just became very old and they were closed, just reducing the impact on the environment. For other elements is, is maybe not so evident the reduction of the concentration, but in any case, Atlas help us to understand what is the level of pollution of the atmosphere in many countries which participate in this program. Speaking about the Republic of Moldova. We have, uh... Sorry. Uh, speaking about Republic of Moldova, uh, Moldova joined the program of ICP vegetation program firstly in 2015, uh, when we collected mosses on the territory. Uh, in Moldova, there are two types of uh, sources of emission of pollutants in the atmosphere. The main part, there are stationary uh, sources of air pollution. They include free power and heat generation facilities, a lot of regional, interregional, local boiler houses. There are also gasoline and gas station and uh, one of the mobile, the most important mobile source of air pollution, of course, it is transport uh, when we speak about cities and uh, towns, especially. In 2015, we collected in Moldova 31 samples, most samples. We tried to cover the entire territory of the country. Most sampling usual, usually is done according to most manual which just inscribed the main conditions which need to be respected during this moss collection. So uh, the black uh, points which you can see on the map, there are sampling sites. Uh, we use two analytical techniques to determine the elemental composition of these MOS samples. The first one, it was neutron activation analysis, which allowed us to determine the wide range of elements and free elements, which are very important from the environment point of view, what it is not possible to determine the using activation analysis, copper, cadmium, and lead. We use the supplementary technique. It was atomic absorption spectrometry. Uh, about samples irradiation, a few words. Uh, neutron activation analysis was performed in the past fast reactor IBR2 in the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research on the installation Regatta, which is located here. Regatta is one of the 14 installation of the reactor where we perform our uh, scientific investigations. The technique uh, is based mainly on the reaction of the neutron capture. When the neutron is captured by the nuclei, we obtain the compound nuclei, which is um, uh, coming to the normal state by the emission of the gamma radiation. So we can just register this radiation using uh, hypergermanium detectors and already process this gamma spectra, which we obtain. Activation analysis is analytical technique, which have a lot of advantages. And of course, like every analytical technique, several disadvantages. Speaking about the advantages of the technique, uh, I would like to mention it is high sensitivity and selectivity is technique absolutely not dependent of the metrics of the samples which are analyzed is not destructive technique in comparison with ICPMS atomic absorption spectrometry we do not need to dissolve samples in acids we work with solid samples uh, is not dependent also of the chemical form of the element at the same time is a technique which allows us to determine more than 45 elements in different kinds of samples of environmental, geological, biological samples. And as disadvantages of the technique, if you would like to apply this technique, you need to have a nuclear reactor. 
firstly. The second, uh, let's say disadvantage, but in case of some samples, even it is advantage, is the time which you require for analysis. So for example, using atomic adsorption, you can obtain the results very quick. But uh, in uh, our case, if we need to determine the full set of the elements, we require like around two months for analysis, for radiation analysis and uh, processing of, of, of the data. And of course, we obtained samples uh, which became the radioactive waste and they required the special conditions of storage. So in case of MOS, the procedure of sample preparation is very easy. You can see it here. We clean MOSs from different impurities like pine needles, leaves, and so on. We collect usually the green part of the MOS. We make such kind of pills because it's very voluminous. Uh, we weigh these samples, we pack them, and we have two modes of irradiation. First one for the determination of elements with short-lived isotopes, the second one for determination of elements with long-lived isotopes. So there are two ways of sample irradiation. As a final result, we can obtain the concentration of the elements, which are marked in green. And as I mentioned previously, three elements marked in red, we use another technique. Speaking about copper, in some cases, when the concentration of copper is high, we can even determine it using neutron activation analysis. For cadmium and lead, is not possible, even at high concentration. On the set of the data which we obtained for Republic of Moldova, we determined the concentration of uh, 38 elements. Is a huge set of data, which is usually when we will present like the Excel file, nobody will understand what it is. So the best way is like in the previous uh, presentation of the Dr. Bogdevich is to make maps, to build maps of the distribution of the pollutants. Um, since the set of data is very big, what we are doing, we process the data statistically and we try to find the cessation between elements. So we use the factor analysis, which help us to, um, let's say, to divide these elements in groups. And our main scope is defined what is the source of these elements. Um, for example, for the set of the data which we obtained in 2015, we uh, divided three main factors. You can see what the first factor included a large number of the elements. And usually we define it like geogenic anthropogenic association of the elements. Why geogenic? Because it includes some elements like, for example, thorium uranium, rare earth elements, aluminium, titanium, which main source we can consider the deposition of the soil particles. It is now what in Moldova climate is dry. And the main part of uh, the territories, there are arable soils. So the soil particles, they can be transferred on the long distances. But at the same time, uh, we have elements like, for example, arsenic, vanadium, and this group of elements, which can be also emitted by the thermal power plants when oil and some heavy oils and in coal is used like fuel. That's why this factor include two groups of the elements and the main contributors in this case were belts, Kishinev and resina. The second factor included three elements. It was chlorine, selenium and strontium. Even consider what vegetation of the high plants can be one of the source of the accumulation of these elements in mosses. The second factor is anthropogenic ones. This include free elements, is cadmium, zinc, and uh, antimony. It is already well known was this free elements a tracer of the transport emissions. You can see what the highest concentration of these elements we determined in Kishinev. And the second place, it was resina. But in resina, in this case, it can be not just transport the source of this elements, but also cement production can contribute to emission of zinc and other elements. I would like to mention what we didn't collect samples in Transnistria, and most probably what in case of Rezina, we can have also some influence from this part of the Moldovan territory of, as well. We calculated several indices just to understand the level of the uh, air pollution in the country. We selected just elements which we consider like environment pollutants. So we calculated the values of the contamination factor enrichment and pollution load index for Moldova for the whole territory using the whole set of data and for Kishinev and Belt separately. So uh, usually is considered like the value of the contamination factor are between one and two. We can say 
today what we have no contamination or just suspected contamination. When values are higher than two, we can say what we have already moderate pollution and at values higher than six, seven, we can speak about the severe pollution of the environment. So the territory of the Moldova can be characterized like unpolluted to moderated polluted depending of the element. The only element we contributed to the severe pollution in Chisinau, it was uranium. So we obtained very high value, it was 12.5. Uh, we consider why like, the main source of the emission is burning of the fuel uh, on the thermal power plants, especially it is well known what if coal is used like fuel, it is enriched in uranium, arsenic and some other elements which contribute to the emission in the atmosphere. Data which we obtained from Moldova, we compared with other European countries which participated in this program, ICP vegetation program. Uh, data for Moldova marked in red. You can see what for some elements, for the main part, let's say, of the elements, values are very high in Moldova, and for vanadium, the highest value we obtained. But at the same time, our values are very close uh, to our neighbor, to values which are obtained for, um, for Romania. In this case, beside national, some let's say local sources of the pollution, uh, it is expected that there are also some transboundary pollution of the atmosphere. In some national reports in Moldova, for example, I found what even Ukraine, Poland, Romania, in some case, some way they also contribute to the pollution of the air uh, in the country. The second survey uh, was performed in 2020. So we have already data for the second survey. In this uh, time, we enlarge the area of sample collection because in the first survey, it was not possible for us to collect mosses in the south part of the country. But in 2020, we collected mosses in this part as well. Again, the same two analytical techniques we, we were used to uh, determine the elemental composition of these moss samples collected in Moldova. And we applied the same statistical tool just to, to understand what sources of air pollution can be defined in this case. So in 2020, we already divided four sources of air pollution, but it's very interesting because you may see what the first factor and the fourth factor, they're almost the same like in 2015. So we have again, geogenic anthropogenic pollution, belts, Chisinau, the main pollution, uh, like the main uh, pollutants and em emitters of these elements. Factor for include, again, elements which are tracers of the transport emissions. But at the same time, we have two new factors. It is second factor, which includes manganese, calcium, and strontium. For these elements, we suppose like mining activity. In Moldova, uh, there are uh, mining of claims, limestone, gypsum. They they can be one of the source of the emission of these elements and their deposition mosses. And the second source include chlorine, potassium, bromine, and copper. So if we can see this chlorine, bromine in some areas near sea, we can suppose like there are some impact from the sea. In case of Moldova, our um, suggestion is what this is the main contributor of emission of these elements is agriculture because a lot of fertilizers, pesticides containing these elements are applied and they can significantly contribute to accumulation of these elements in uh, uh, most samples. Uh, next stage, what we did, we tried to compare the data which we obtained in two surveys in 2020 and 2015. Uh, it's interesting to mention what in 2020 we observed the decrease of the concentration of the main part of the element. So zinc was the only element which content increased in 2020, but applying Wilkinson test, we found what significant differences were found for lead, cadmium, copper, chromium, arsenic, and uh, antimony. So um, the most significant reduction which we obtained, it was for lead. Uh, firstly, we're thinking why it happens like this, 72% is, is really significant reduction. But just one week ago, I participated on another conference in, uh, in Chisinau, where one of the colleagues from the Institute of uh, Geography, she just uh, 
showed the presentation about fetal remediation of the lead. And she said what in 2015, Moldova adopted this um, order to restrict the use of leaded gasoline. So in 2015, most probably we collected more as before. And in 2020, after five years, you may see what the, the content of lead in most samples was reduced by 72%. Just one decision and such significant reduction of the elements content in, in most samples. The next stage, what we did, we tried to find using principal component analysis, just to understand if we, if the sources of the air pollution in Tosa ways and um, elements which contribute the pollution are the same. So you may see the data for 2015 and the data for 2020, and in both ways, belts, Chisinau and Resina are the extremes. So there are the places which contribute mainly to air pollution in the country. Speaking about the elements, it's the same. You can see what in both surveys, cadmium, lead, and zinc, they form the same group of the elements. So the transport is one of the source of air pollution in the country. The second group of the elements, including copper, antimony, nickel. So in this case, we can say what we have contribution from the deposition of the soil particles and some industrial activity and the impact, impact of the industrial activity, which is mainly developed in these um, big uh, cities. Uh, the rural area, samples which were collected mainly in the rural area, they form just one cluster. So we can very clearly define and we can just affirm that in both ways we have almost the same sources of air pollution. So during five years, nothing significantly changed uh, in the country. For 2020, we also calculated the values for this contamination factor for Republic of Moldova, for Chisinau, and for Belt separately. You can see here elements which contribute mainly for uh, air on air pollution in uh, both uh, cities. In uh, Chisinau is mainly arsenic and antimony and uh, four elements in uh, Belts. The technique about what I was talking is uh, uh, passive biomonitoring, but since Kishinev showed to be the most polluted place, we decided to perform also active biomonitoring studies in Moldova. We collected mosses in Tver region, we packed them in such special bags, and we exposed these moss bags in three places in Moldova. It was the main, the building of the Academy of Science, Botanical Garden, and Thermal Power Plant. Mosses were exposed for five months months from October till March in 2018. One sample was kept here in laboratory in Dubna like the control sample. And after that, we just calculated the relative accumulation factor values for these uh, elements. So what we noticed, we noticed the significant accumulation of uh, antimony, of uranium, and other elements and more samples exposed in uh, Kishinev. And here there are also the distribution of this concentration of the elements by uh, months. Um, the orange line which you see is the concentration of these uh, elements in uh, control moss sample. So uh, the most significant increase of vanadium, antimony, arsenic and uh, concentration we noticed on the thermopower plants. As I previously mentioned, uh, burning of the fuel is one of the main sources of emission of these elements. Antimony uh, high concentration were also determined on two other places of the ex exposure. It can be explained by the fact was transport is also one of the emitter of the antimony. In case of iron, uh, even we cannot define this uh, source, but we can suppose what deposition of soil particles, again, transport or just weathering can be like responsible for deposition of soil particle on this um, most samples. And in case of um, arsenic, Again, on the thermal power st station, it was uh, like the, the main. So performing this two type of biomonitoring, passive and active, we, it was possible to determine the large number of the elements in most samples collected in uh, Moldova and to define the main pollution sources. Uh, we can consider now performing both type of biomonitoring like thermal power plants 
and transport contribute significantly to emission of these uh, elements in, in the atmosphere. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to propose to Professor Bogdevich to use our data also maybe for mapping for creation of these maps, which are used by uh, after that in this program of um, assessment of the air quality in, in the country. Thank you. Uh, greetings. Uh, uh, my presentation will be about most monitoring of air pollution in Georgia. Uh, uh, first of all, I'll start uh, uh, with uh, uh, the study area. Uh, Georgia is a mountainous country located uh, in the southern part of uh, Caucasus. Uh, the uh, landscape uh, within the national borders is quite varied. Uh, Western Georgian landscape ranges from low rain uh, land, marsh forests, swamps, and temperate rainforests to occur on snow and glaciers, while the Eastern part of our country even contains small segment of semi-arid plains, uh, and uh, about forty percent of the country is uh, covered with forests, and about uh, ten percent of the country is uh, subalpine and alpine uh, meadows. Uh, so uh, the territory is very varied, uh, and uh, mm, uh, we participated in the Muslim program since 2014. As uh, Inga Zinkonska has already spoken about uh, this uh, program, I'll just uh, uh, show you, uh, for example, uh, the distribution map uh, uh, of uh, uh, lead, which already was already mentioned. Uh, and uh, uh, in this program, uh, uh, it provides about uh, information about 20, uh, 12 elements, uh, nitrogen, and persistent organic pollutants in mosses. Um, uh, for example, I showed here uh, the results, our first results about Georgia, for example, as in, uh, in case of uh, lead, uh, here we can see uh, that Georgia is, uh, uh, is quite contaminated uh, with a lead. Uh, again, one of the main reasons is uh, the uh, uh, transport uh, uh, in the gas zone. Uh, some restrictions only came uh, 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 now, and uh, um, uh, we'll see the difference in future, I hope. Uh, uh, about sampling. Uh, for the sampling of mosses, uh, we used uh, uh, moss manual. Uh, samples were collected during uh, the period uh, from April to October. Uh, the sampling uh, points were located at at least 300 meters away from main roads and highways and villages and some industrial places, uh, while uh, 100 meters away from smaller roads and houses. Uh, and for each sampling, um, Sites up to 10 subsamples were taken uh, in the area of uh, uh, 2,500 uh, 2, meters. Uh, here uh, we can uh, see our previous uh, sampling map uh, where we collected about 120 samples uh, covering uh, the biggest part of our country. Uh, uh, here we can uh, see our new sampling map. Uh, which you know, we started uh, our new survey in 2019. Uh, fortunately, in 2020, we were not able to collect samples. Uh, and uh, uh, the other problem is that uh, all, not all the samples were analyzed. That's why I write uh, 35 samples. I will mostly today speak about uh, in the central part uh, uh, about the samples which are collected in the central part of Georgia. Uh, because of a uh, 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 reactor which was uh, closed, we were not able to an analyze uh, in, in time the other samples which are already collected, but not analyzed. Uh, but we'll do it uh, soon uh, with other techniques. Uh, most samples uh, we collected uh, uh, flowers and strawberry, Hilcomus plantains, uh, hidden first former, which are uh, the main, uh, mainly used uh, most species for uh, uh, passive monitoring. Uh, uh, and uh, we added Abetina la Abetina uh, for uh, covering other territories where we can find that uh, this uh, 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 mosses. 
uh, analysis. Uh, first one element was determined using uh, neutron Cauchy analysis uh, uh, and uh, on a, a regard facility at the uh, EGO uh, 2 reactor. Uh, and uh, to fill the gap, uh, we uh, used the complementary method, atom pressure system for cadmium, cuprum, and plumbum. Uh, um, for uh, that analysis, uh, multiple statistics was applied. Uh, principal plot analysis allowed us uh, to uh, 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 distinguish four factors associated with different sources. Now here you can see three factors uh, uh, on this graph. Um, and that the dispersal of uh, factors uh, scores uh, over the study area uh, were built uh, using RGs. Uh, here you can see the first factor, as well said, um, mainly the first factor is associated with uh, uh, soil dust, uh, it is contribution of uh, light and heavy cross component elements. Uh, the second factor uh, is uh, uh, chlorium, uh, potassium, uh, zinc, salmon, bromine, yielding, and copper. Uh, copper. Uh, the main uh, possible uh, reason uh, of uh, these elements is agricultural activity, as uh, the elements are often used in um, fertilizers. Um, the third factor uh, is uh, arsenic, uh, 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 antimony, and tungsten. Uh, the uh, uh, the main uh, uh, reason why we had this factor is uh, this location, which is uh, Urawi village, uh, which was a mining and uh, chemical factory uh, function during the Soviet era in this uh, area. And uh, uh, arsen has been mined there uh, about 60 years. Uh, and uh, there are some brewings uh, and waste uh, of arsenic. Uh, the fourth factor is uh, cadmium, cadmium, uh, plumbum, and brown, which is uh, mostly uh, anthropogenic. Uh, I'll speak a little about arsenic. Uh, Hacostat for arsenic was observed in one single location in 2016. Uh, and um, uh, how are all as arsenic measurements showed no anomalies. It was uh, quite strange to see such a big concentration. It was 83.3 uh, milligram per kilogram uh, on uh, in Moses, which is a very high concentration. Uh, and uh, we decided uh, to uh, increase our sampling uh, uh, dots uh, in that area to see uh, how much it is, uh, 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 what uh, has changed there and uh, what is the situation overall in that part, uh, in that um, uh, village. Uh, in Urawi, uh, arsenic mining sites were abandoned in 1992 and approximately 100,000 uh, pounds of weights containing arsenic clay were left on surface areas. So in 2019, when we take uh, at the same place, uh, it is interesting that uh, the construction has decreased already three times. Uh, and uh, uh, mean in the region is 1.1, uh, which is high, but uh, not catastrophic as 83. And uh, the mean in the country is 0.7 uh, uh, million per kilogram. So it means that uh, exactly that uh, location where we take a sample uh, was uh, quite contaminated uh, with arsenic. Uh, what is um, and uh, the main reason was uh, the food which has happened in 2011. Uh, uh, also uh, about uh, five years and uh, three years needed uh, to decrease the concentration uh, of arsenic in that location. Uh, or three times. Uh, most of the time provides a cheap and efficient method to uh, deposition analysis for the identification areas at risk for microscopic deposition products of heavy metals. Uh, considerable potential ecological risks of arsenic still exist in the environment of the village of uh, Urawi, and uh, then data might be used as a baseline data for the air pollution deposition and they'll hold up any possible demands of the air pollution in Georgia. Thank you all for your attention. I would like to present you results uh, about uh, biomonitoring project in uh, Central Russia. Uh, 
Uh, as uh, Inga said, uh, thank you for my colleague, <laughs> for head of our department. Uh, she described this program very well. Uh, uh, I see people, uh, our biomonitoring project also was done in the framework uh, of the same ICP project uh, program. And uh, you hear about it, very popular. Uh, as Inga said, um, this program have a special monitoring manual uh, where describe uh, all uh, parameters, uh, where you should collect uh, MOSIS, uh, how to collect, uh, and so on. Many, many questions. So according to this, uh, Manual and our experience, uh, we collected uh, samples in our regions. Uh, so during uh, summer period uh, in uh, 2018 and 2019, uh, we collected uh, samples uh, in Moscow region. Uh, we collected 156 samples, uh, 72 samples in Vladimir region and uh, 53 samples in uh, Yaroslavl region. So uh, as Inga said, it's a really good uh, alternative method uh, to, for uh, estimation of uh, air contamination uh, because uh, during this short period, we managed to collect samples from, uh, from the area approximately 100,000 square kilometers. So, uh, as a main analytical method, uh, we use uh, neutron activation analysis. And um, also for copper, cadmium, and uh, lead, we use atomic absorption. And the uh, combination of these methods uh, allow us uh, to determine uh, uh, concentration of uh, 35 uh, elements uh, in MOSES. Uh, I forgot to say that uh, on uh, all three regions, we collected uh, Pleurosium schreberi moss uh, species. Uh, in our geographic zone, uh, you can easily find this uh, spe uh, moss species uh, in our forest. So uh, we try to understand the uh, possible sources of these uh, uh, elements. And for these uh, purposes, um, statistical methods uh, allow very well. Uh, and of course, we use uh, factor analysis. So uh, factor analysis uh, in Moscow region shows show us uh, five possible groups uh, of sources. And the uh, first group, it's uh, usually a combination of uh, geogenic and anthropogenic uh, factor. It, we usually call it soil factor. The second uh, factor, it's industrial. Uh, it's, uh, it contains uh, rubidium and cesium. In some uh, industry, they use uh, these elements in micro scheme and so on in industries. Uh, for, uh, third factor, it's transport. Uh, it's a combination of zinc, cadmium, uh, lead, and copper. Uh, factor four, it's a vegetation uh, factor. Uh, it's uh, macro elements. And uh, factor five, uh, it's industrial factor. Uh, you see a combination of uh, heavy metals in this group. Um, and on the maps, uh, you see distribution factor three and five. Uh, factor three, it's transport. It's uh, uh, evenly distributed over the whole territory of Moscow region. And uh, factor five, um, high, uh, uh, high concentration on the eastern part of uh, Moscow region and uh, around uh, Moscow, uh, so-called uh, satellite city that supplied uh, uh, products uh, to our capital. For Vladimir region uh, factor analysis uh, showed us uh, four possible uh, sources uh, of these uh, elements. It's first factor, it's again a combination uh, geogenic and, and uh, anthropogenic factor. Uh, the second factor, it's transport. Uh, you, see, you can see uh, uh, elements that uh, included in this factor. Uh, th third factor, it's soil. 
rubidium, cesium, uh, cerium, and tamarium. And the uh, fourth factor also macro elements. And on the map, I showed the uh, uh, second factor and the high con uh, concentration on the western part of uh, this region uh, that's uh, that really close to Moscow region. Uh, it's uh, on the border of Moscow region. And also high content uh, in the vicinity of uh, uh, cities, towns of these regions. And for Yaroslavl region, uh, factor analysis uh, reveal uh, us uh, five factors. Uh, and uh, factor three and factor five uh, sh showed uh, us uh, anthropogenic uh, contamination, uh, anthropogenic sources, uh, it's industrial uh, sources. Uh, for factor three, it's uh, high concentration uh, in Yaroslavl, uh, Tutaev, and Rybinsk. Uh, in these uh, towns, uh, concentrated uh, uh, all industrial enterprises. Uh, it's uh, motor uh, industry, uh, oil refinery, uh, and uh, uh, other chemical industries. Uh, and uh, factor number five, it's also industrial uh, and uh, transport factor. And the high con uh, concentration uh, for factor five, we see for this element, vanadium, zinc, uh, antimony, and lead, uh, we observe uh, around the uh, Yaroslavl uh, city. It's the center of this region. And uh, in this uh, city in Yaroslavl, there is a huge oil refinery uh, plant, uh, probably the biggest uh, oil refinery plant in uh, central Russia. Uh, we also calculated uh, ecolo ecological indices, and, and uh, uh, you can see it uh, in the table. And according to this uh, indices, uh, general uh, situation in Moscow region, uh, quite good, uh, or oh, not Moscow region, in, in investigated regions in Vladimir, Yaroslavl, and Moscow region. Uh, quite good. And uh, contamination factors showed us uh, that uh, there, there are no contamination or suspected contamination. And only for Moscow region, if we calculated uh, uh, separate uh, contamination factors for uh, Eastern part uh, that I showed uh, with high concentration, uh, in that part, we can observe uh, moderate uh, pollution uh, for uh, contamination. Uh, we uh, have a project uh, from other region of Russian region. Uh, uh, with, uh, we also have data from a uh, different uh, biomonitoring project of Russia. And uh, on these graphs, you can see uh, that uh, in the uh, investigated area, quite low concentration comparison uh, compared to other regions. Only for antimony in Moscow region, uh, one of the highest level for uh, uh, contamination. Uh, antimony, it's uh, the uh, element that show, uh, show us uh, con uh, contamination by transport. Uh, and in Moscow region have a lot of uh, highways, uh, roads, uh, a lot of um, uh, transports uh, in Moscow region. That's why in this region, uh, high level of uh, antimony. So uh, in the uh, investigated area, many uh, main uh, uh, pollution sources, it's transport and industries. Uh, and the biomonitoring method uh, help us to understand it and uh, help us easy uh, evaluate this situation. And uh, I would like to say uh, thanks for my colleagues uh, that helped me on every step from collecting MOS to process uh, results and uh, for handling radioactive samples. And thank you for attention. Thank you for your report. We saw a large report from Institute of <clears throat> Joint Institute for Nuclear Research. <clears throat> so
So, uh, dear participants, if you have some questions, please ask. No, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Dr. Constantin. Constantin Vergel. And thank you. Uh, next presentation is present. Uh, Donala, um, do you have a question? Okay. Oh. Um, Very good. Спасибо. Можно я буду на русском, потому что английский не совсем понимаю и не владею английским. Конечно, можно. Конечно. Здравствуйте. Здравствуйте. Скажите, пожалуйста, вот вы выявили, что у вас как бы разные уровни загрязнения все такое. Вот мне интересно, вы сделали какую-нибудь взаимосвязь между вашими показателями, которые вы выявили по разным этим содержаниям, и климатическими факторами, как они как бы повлияли на показания температур, осадков, проявляется ли как-нибудь это в виде... Сер, это, кислотных дождей, все такое. Есть у вас такие как бы, измерения? Такие... Таки, таких данных у нас нет, потому что мы работаем в рамках этой программы и в основном изучаем тяжелые металлы, и органические соединения мы не, не исследуем, например. Да, и у нас даже в рамках одной программы возникают вопросы по тому... За какой период, например, мхи накапливают это? Один месяц или год или пять лет? Поэтому это все еще обсуждается в рамках этой программы. Но конкретно, например, изучение влияния влажности в июне на содержание в августе, таких Нет. Спасибо. работ Просто... не было. Можно я, добавлю? Можно я только добавлю? Мы на самом деле... В 2020 году, да, мы, пришли, да, да, да. мы как, после того, как у нас был некий локдаун в Московской области, мы посмотрели, мы собрали мхи в 2019-2020, сравнили, насколько локдаун повлиял на изменение содержания элементов. Да? Uh -huh. Если говорить о части Московской области, которая близко к Москве, там, в принципе, ничего не поменялось. Часть, которая была дальше, да, в нашу, например, сторону, у нас сильно уменьшились вот те элементы, которые являются трейсерами, транспортного загрязнения. И мы mm -hmm. тогда же и решили, это мы, наверное, уже на следующей конференции покажем, э, у нас была бесснежная зима и снежная зима. Вот мы собрали мхи после бесснежной зимы и после снежной. Вот как раз, чтобы оценить, влияет ли вот этот снежный покров каким-то образом на накопление элементов, но у нас, к сожалению, пока не готовы эти а, данные. Анализ я проведен. Но проблема в том, что когда мхи собираются раз в пять лет, это перспектива дальносрочного загрязнения, mm -hmm. а не быстрого загрязнения, которое там легко отследить. Mm -hmm. Спасибо. Ну, иногда эти, вот эти концентрации могут влиять и ветра, направление ветров, наверное, тоже и иногда у вас mm -hmm. вот, да, доминирующие ветра. Я uh, тоже... Да, доминирующие ветра. У нас многие спрашивают, как мы используем направление ветра, но на самом деле сеть пробоотбора такая частая, что мы уже на самой сети видим, что у нас западные ветра в основном преимущественно в нашей зоне. Мы даже по, когда строим карты распределения, мы видим, что само загрязнение вытягивается с запада на восток. Потому что сеть достаточно частая пробоотбора. Там между точками порядка 20 километров. Okay, thank you for your question, for your interesting presentation and uh, our interaction. Um, we will be despre impactul schimbărilor climatice, uh, anume a supradate de manifestarea înghețurilor pe teritoriul Republicii Moldova. Pentru că vedem că și înghețurile sunt uh, un fenomen climatic de risc, care aduce daune agricultorilor și în analiza efectuată pentru anii 2005-2020 ne arată că și acest fenomen a fost cumva dereglat, să spun așa, de către schimbările care au loc la nivel climatic. Este indiscutabil că schimbările climatice au loc și 
acestea au un impact negativ asupra tuturor activităților umane. Ele se cumva perturbă, perturbă evoluția normală a tuturor activităților umane și mai ales au un impact foarte nefast asupra celor care se ocupă de agricultură. Toate aceste perturbații au loc, sunt, se soldează cu pierderi economice, deoarece fenomenele sunt, devin destul de imprevizibile și au un impact de amploare. De exemplu, ne mijlocit dacă ne referim la uh, înghețurile care au loc în afara uh, perioadei reci, uh, impactul are loc asupra vegetației, a culturilor de viță de vie, a semănăturilor uh, de toamnă. Uh, Cercetările efectuate asupra acestui fenomen au stabilit că o corelare direct proporțională între daunele produse și data de manifestare a înghețurilor. Acestea sunt cu atât mai periculoase cu cât se manifestă în faza de formare a rudimentelor productivității, care datorită temperaturilor ridicate, Uh, unele plante ajung în faza medie de dezvoltare și astfel de scădere bruște a temperaturii devine destul de stresantă pentru culturile agricole. Uh, aceasta se exprimă prin degerături sau chiar moartea plantelor. Uh, în astfel, uh, înghețurile ating magnitudinea unui stres ecologic. Dacă să analiza datelor medii multianuale, ne arată că primele înghețuri se manifestă în prima decadă a lunii octombrie și se termină în a doua decadă a lunii aprilie. Desigur, cu careva diferențiere teritoriale destul de semnificative, uneori chiar și de 5 zile de la nord spre sud. Calculul statistic a stabilit că perioada supusă studiului 2005-2020, cel mai târziu în viață a fost înregistrat la stațiile meteorologice Soroca și Camenca, 10 mai 2017. Cum spuneam, calculul statistic pentru perioada supusă studiului ne arată că... Cel mai târziu în gheț a fost înregistrat la stațiile meteorologice Soroca și Camenca la 10 mai 2017, ceea ce înseamnă cu 18 zile mai târziu față de data medie determinată în studiile anterioare, adică în studiile efectuate până în 2005, care corespundea cu data de 22 aprilie. De asemenea, și data de manifestare a primelor înghețuri cunoaște o careva diferență datorită, acestor, datorită impactului schimbărilor. Spre exemplu, deja în prima decada a lunii octombrie, este, se caracterizează prin probabilitatea apariției a primelor înghețuri de diferită intensitate și vedem că la fel aceste înghețuri au loc cu 20 de zile mai devreme decât în perioada anterior analizată. Ca concluzii, putem spune că în rezultatul acestor cercetări 
observăm clar influența care o are schimbările care au loc la nivel climatic și asupra datei de manifestare a înghețurilor periculoase, ceea ce constituie 18 zile mai târziu pentru înghețurile de primăvară și 20 de zile mai devreme are loc manifestarea înghețurilor de toamnă. Paralel cu aceasta se poate de menționat că are loc și o majorare cu aproximativ 18 zile a duratei perioadei fără îngheț. Vă mulțumesc pentru atenție. Da, bună ziua încă o dată. Vreau să prezint rezultatele obținute la tema privind investigarea influenței poluanților emiși de către transportul auto asupra proprietăților plantelor în ecosistemul urban bălți. Pentru cercetări au fost analizată specie de arbore tilia cordata din ecosistemul menționat. Pentru început vreau să menționez că numărul unităților de transport în, atât în Republică cât și în regiunea de dezvoltare Nord este în creștere. Dinamica poate fi observată în imaginea alăturată și pot să menționez că în municipiul Bălții la data de 1 în septembrie 21 au fost înregistrate 49.453 unități. În figura alăturată este prezentată distribuția numărului unităților de transport pe principalele arterii de circulație din ecosistemul dat. Și poate fi observat că în sectorul centru, strada Ștefan cel, cel Mare, este cel mai mare număr al acestor unități. Urmată de sector... Uh, urmată de strada de centură. Uh, au fost efectuate și cercetări privind conținutul de clorofil în frunzele speciei menționate, iar totodată și și cantitatea totală de apă. Poate fi, în figurile alăturate poate fi observată că Anume în sectorul centru, unde este și cel mai mare număr al unităților de transport, se vede că acest conținut este mai redus. Aceeași legitate poate fi observată și pentru conținutul de clorofilă, adică raportul dintre clorofila A și B în frunze. În concluzie pot, pot menționa că Că concentrația de emisii este în strânsă legătură cu concentrația de clorofilă în frunze și impactul, și impactul este mai mare. Mulțumesc! Thank you for presentation for your poster. Do you have some question for, for Andrian? Please, Dr. Inga. Which language should I ask? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in Romania <laughs> or in Russia. Uh, întrebarea mea este cum considerați care poluanți contribuie mai mult la aceste schimbări pe care le observați? Poluarea cu metale, cu compuși organici? Ați cercat acest tip de studii să înțelegeți? Să înțelegeți care poluare contribuie mai mult? Din cercetările noastre putem menționa că anume emisiile gazoase au o influență mai nefastă asupra plantelor. Mulțumesc! I'm from Old Russian Scientific Research Institute of Tobacco, Macorca and Tobacco Products. And um, my work dedicated for investigation of toxic compounds in the aerosol of the tobacco heating system. 
These products are popular in our country and in Moldova, I mean too. And uh, we investigation of aerosol, aerosol from uh, these tobacco heating systems and compared with aerosol of uh, cigarettes or tobacco smoke. We know that tobacco smoke consists of uh, some toxic compounds and the World Health Organization, these compounds uh, is, is nicotine, is benzene, benzpirin, acetaldehyde, formaldehyde, and uh, some other. And these compounds in aerosol of uh, tobacco heating system are very low. And you can see in my screen these, these graphs. But nicotine is not so low as uh, other compounds. And, um, and we can see um, that nicotine about 70, 17% or about 19%. With, with a comparison if, of tobacco smoke. And so these products as tobacco heating system, we can use as alternative um, from tobacco products, from cigarettes, as other compounds, as carbon monoxide, benzpirin, butadiene, benzene, formaldehyde, and so the aldehyde and the proline is very low by comparison with uh, tobacco smoke, with reference cigarette. Um, and a few words about reference cigarette. Reference cigarette is a scientific, scientific instrument. This is not commercial product, but this product in scientific researches. So these products as tobacco heating system can be alternative to traditional cigarettes. 